So you, you guys all know I'm not Bob Murphy, right? You're still going to stay here. You're not going to leave. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I'm Patrick Newman. Thank you for attending. Uh, the title of my talk is America 2021, The Threat of Progressivism. Okay. So I gave a talk uh, on the progressive era and sort of our current uh, climate, political climate, earlier in the summer in June in Birmingham, Alabama. And I... Uh, posed the question, are we on the cusp of another progressive era? Because what I was trying to dis sort of show was how since March, when the world sort of bottomed out and the economy cratered, unemployment shot up to around 20 percent, uh, industrial production fell. We later found out that in the second quarter, real GDP declined at about an you know an annualized rate of 33 percent, which is which is really bad. This sort of like Great Depression bad. Uh, in how the government was passing all of these policies, uh, the stimulus checks, uh, the CARES Act, uh, the Federal Reserve's very expansionary monetary policy, all of the the lockdowns and in uh, local ordinances and so on, et cetera, et cetera. A very sharp increase in government intervention. And I was trying to compare it to the progressive era of the early 1900s and show how well we were sort of mirroring, mirroring this, 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 this massive increase in government intervention, and we were on the cusp of this. So fortunately, the economy has gotten a little bit better. Unemployment has gone down to about you know, 10 percent, you know, only you know, 10, 10 percent or something like that, you know, only. Uh, industrial production has gone up uh, a little bit. And this is, you know, you can't really argue at all that this is from expansionary fiscal or monetary policy at all. You know, this is just simply from allowing the economy to at least partially reopen. So it's amazing what will happen if you literally practice a hands-off policy. You know, you allow businesses to open and they'll actually produce goods. It's, it's, quite, it's quite incredible, you know, if you just let them sort of do their job, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, we, we've been experiencing that. And, you know, if this will continue throughout the rest of the year uh, and really, you know, next year, a lot of that kind of depends on what the government's going to do, what's going to happen in the election. Uh, you know, the situation doesn't look pretty either way. I mean, I think, though, that we're on. We certainly, you know, you could see some very seismic changes happening in November, and that could spill over into what's going to happen and that the 2020s, really 2021, is in really February 2021, uh, sort of like the last, uh, you know, uh, you know, you, you could, during the Great Recession when you passed a lot of big federal laws, um, you know, you could see another progressive era, okay? So really a threat because these policies are a threat to our economic freedoms, to our, you know, uh, economic well-being, to our personal liberty, to our sanity, to our, at least I, I definitely know my sanity, to our, you know, our, 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 our psychological state of mind, et cetera. I mean, these, these are things that could really cause a very serious, uh, uh, a, a lot of serious problems. So it's why I said sort of the threat of progressivism, right? And you sort of imagine, you know, what I try and sort of visualize is you have this, this great sort of mighty progressive juggernaut basically coming. So everyone have in their mind of what a juggernaut is or at least what you think a juggernaut is. You know, it's sort of like, you know, it's just this careening. It's this giant machine sort of unstoppable, consuming everything in its wake, right? And, you know, it's sort of lumbering ahead to America. And, you know, how do we, how do we stop this, okay? Now, okay, when you talk about a progressive juggernaut, you know, I've already given very uh, vivid imagery, and hopefully you see me there with like some sort of sh you know, sword and a shield or something trying to stop it. Uh, I'm an economist, so I can make unrealistic assumptions, right? Um, so, uh, you know, what exactly do we mean by progressive? Because, you know, who wouldn't want to be a progressive? When you think of the word, it means progress. Who wouldn't want to progress? You know, human civilization would want to increase material well-being for people would want to make people happier. I mean, that's the word progress, right? You know, certainly by that simple definition, I, you know, no one says, well, I'm a, I'm a regressive. You know, I'm, I'm actually regressive. I want, to, I want to decrease living standards for everyone, you know, make things worse off. I'm sort of a reactionary. Uh, you know, it doesn't really sell well, right? You know, unfortunately, though, that's not what the word means. That's not what I'm trying to say that the word means. Because certainly progressives would like you to believe that's what the word, word means. Okay. Murray Rothbard talks about that a lot in his book, The Progressive Era, which I'll be discussing. Okay. 
word changes sort of controlling the meaning of words like liberal, like what originally meant libertarian, classical liberal, you know, so we have to describe it now. Now means something very, uh, very different. You know, what uh, Jeff was describing would really be considered a federalist in the original description of the, uh, of the word in the 1770s, early 1780s, and that you want a decentralized relationship between the states and the government. But that's not what federalist meant, right? Then federalist basically meant nationalist, okay? And then you call the opposition anti-federalists. That's another thing Rothbard talks about in Conceiving Liberty. No one wants to be called an anti-federalist. You just sound negative, right? You got anti, like no one, no one likes that, right? So what we really mean by progressive what I mean by progressive, what I mean to say by a progressive era or a progressive juggernaut is cronyism, okay? So cronyism is when the government passes policies not in the public interest. They might say it's in the public interest, which we'll talk about, but it's really to benefit special interests. It's to benefit connected corporations and businesses, politicians and bureaucrats, you know, intellectuals, so academics, technocrats, policymakers, et cetera, in, so you think of labor unions or other activists, what I like to call agitators of personal, agitators of strife, basically, okay? So, and they're benefiting these concentrated groups at the expense of the public overall, okay? Now, of course what they do is you can't sell anything like that. You can't say, well, actually I'm only, you know, running to just benefit myself and my, you know, my, my connected businesses and my other donors. Right? You're not going to win. The public's going to get out their pitchforks right, and drive you out of office or whatever sort of government position you're in. You know, instead, you have to cloak it in this public interest rhetoric. You have to say, well, you know, you have, it, 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 these policies are benefiting the public. They're making us all better, et cetera, and so on. So you think of something like the Paycheck Protection Program. Right? It was you know, ostensibly to provide for people when they're struggling right? Because they can't work. So, you know, you're a business, except you can apply for these, these loans and so on. It's got this very public interest, uh, you know, uh, you sort of mantle this description. And then in reality, you find out a couple months later, there's a bunch of, you know, attorneys and wealthy doctors and, and other sorts of rich companies that, you know, didn't really, quote, need the money, but they had the political net connections, the connections with banks to be able to get in line first. It's very clear cronyism, right? So, you have this public interest, you know, you have this stated public interest, and of course, how do you do it? Well, that's a very crucial group. One of the groups I just mentioned, you have the intellectuals that help you. They sort of spin, you know, they, they, the, the intelligentsia, they sort of spin the apology. They say, well, it, it's benefiting, it's in the public interest, all right? And in reality, they're just sort of getting a cut on the side, okay? So that relationship, that cronyism that I was speaking about between intellectuals and the government, et cetera, that's something known, uh, and Jeff sort of uh, referenced this, that's something known originally as the alliance of throne and altar, right? So how does the king, how did the king back in the day sort of uh, get the public to support all of his policies, you know, to pay their taxes, to go fight for him, to give up some of their land, some of their resources, et cetera? Well, you had the priests who said the king was divine, he comes from God, you have to listen to him. Uh, worship the king. He's literally larger than life in many ways because he was given all the food. So he'd literally be like a giant back in the day. He'd be like 5'11 or something, right? So I'd be pretty tall back then, which would have been cool. Uh, and instead, he said, you know, in the, 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 the priests say this, and instead, well, the king will give him some taxpayer money. They build a nice church, gives him some cushy jobs, sort of cozy sinecures, right? And nowadays, we have the intellectuals do that. So they are in their state universities, in their nice jobs there, you know, the term for that is tenure. Uh, we, you know, that you have uh, the co com comfy think tanks, policy analysts, et cetera, advisors to politicians, and they sort of spin all of these justifications for these various interventions, these acts of cronyism. They say it's not cronyism. They say it's progressivism, right? And that's how these policies sort of get supported. Okay, so that's what I mean by progressive. It's really sort of crony, okay? That's the idea. So you think of are we on the cusp of another progressive era? You say, are we on the cusp of another era of cronyism? Or when I say America 2021, the threat of progressivism, I say America 2021, the threat of cronyism. Okay. So, you know, all right, I mentioned that. Now, what I want to try and do is sort of compare some of the progressives of today, 2020, with some of the progressives of the past, 1920 or 1900. 
okay, and sort of show how they're similar. You sort of name some names. You show they came actually from sort of similar backgrounds or similar motivations, similar types of policies, and how it's really, you know, there's not a whole lot different, kind of. Uh, in many ways, it's very similar, all right? So who are the progressives of the past? All right, these people that uh, your average, you know, social studies teacher or your history professor would say, you know, they were the they were the great um, champions of the public interest and et cetera. Who, you know, who were these men and women? Okay, well, you know, they actually came from a fairly homogenous background. Okay, they they wouldn't really pass the diversity test today. They all came from New England. Okay, they were Yankees. Okay, what that meant was you basically were the descendants of the Puritans. Right? And you lived in New England or you emigrated to Western New York, to the Midwest, et cetera. Okay? And you had a intense, sort of from the second great awakening of the 1830s, you had an intense, sort of even, you know, just, just an intense, fiery uh, religious uh, aspect to your thinking. So religious itself isn't bad, being you know, Christian, et cetera, evangelical, not saying that. But it's the idea that you need to remake the world. Okay. You need to stamp out sin. If you want to save yourself, you have to save others. Okay. Sort of a post-millennial pietist, I guess, is what Rothbard would describe them as. Okay. So they had this fiery drive to change the world. And you're either with them or you're against them. So first, you uh, prohibit alcohol consumption. Okay. You make uh, schools read, uh, you know, teach from a certain Bible, et cetera. You try and control the education system. Right? And then this spreads to economic intervention. Because what happened, and this is exactly like the progressives of today, is that they became secularized, right? So they all got their PhDs. Back in the day, they got their PhDs from Germany. So in the late 19th century, they went to the Bismarck Second Reich, right? The Bismarckian welfare state. They got their PhDs at these big jobs, you know, I mean, excuse me, at these large uh, schools, these state schools, et cetera. In Germany back then, it was very anti-free market anti-theory, very pro-interventionist, right? So all these, you know, all these new academics, right? They come back to America. They say, wow, this is great. You know, this, 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 is, this is awesome. We now need to change the world. We now need to make sure we need to uh, pass all sorts of regulations. We need to centralize economic activity. We need to create what's known as the fourth branch of government, the administrative state, okay? the, the, my least favorite branch of government. Okay, it's the one that doesn't even, it's not even supposed to exist, but it does. Um, and so they had this intense desire to now teach everyone else how to behave. Okay, they were also intensely elitist. Okay, they believed in eugenics, the idea that you could control the labor supply to improve the overall quality. So you could basically drive out the unwanted people in society. You use a minimum wage to unemploy immigrants or other you know, less desirable elements of society. So immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe, uh, Africans, South Americans, Asians, et cetera, those all interfered with the, uh, the, 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 the Yankee, basically. So the Yankee was the elite and it would control everyone else, all right? And of course, they wanted to spread this across the world. You know, they thought big, right? So you think of Wilson, Wilsonian democracy, Right, you now need to go invade Europe and so on. So, hopefully, as I'm saying this, you know, you're kind of thinking, okay, that sounds somewhat familiar to today. Um, so you think, all right, you know, at least going through some of the big characteristics, you know, they're Yankee, they're Pietist, they're uh, very academic, they're elitist, they're also a bunch of foreign interventionists. So the only way you could really describe this is they were sort of pestiferous busybodies. They wanted to interfere in everyone's life tell them how to behave because they knew what was better uh, for you, okay? In terms of economics, you know, what were the actual sorts of policies that they were supporting? Again, things sort of very similar to what you hear about now, right? So you had the two groups, you could say, the two types of economic philosophies. The, and sometimes they were working together, sometimes they were clashing, the people in those groups. You had the corporatists and the socialists, okay? The corporatists were those large progressive businesses and intellectuals and politicians. They didn't like the free market. These businesses are trying to achieve, achieve monopolies, okay? But they're unable to due to the uh, market competition, new competitors coming in, cartels breaking up, and so on. So they wanted the government to 
pass all sorts of new regulations, create new trade commissions to basically clamp down on this various types of competition, price competition, product competition, et cetera. Right? So things like the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Reserve System, right? the Interstate Commerce Commission, what later became the Food and Drug Administration, and so on, all of the regulatory commissions uh, I don't like. Um, there's not many I do like. But anyway, these are all the very problematic regulatory commissions. And they wanted to uh, basically have the government create sort of cartels that would be able to administer society. This is actually the original form of fascism. And it's no surprise that many of the progressives were enthusiastic proponents of Mussolini's Italian uh, fascist state in the 1920s. Okay. Now, the other group is the socialists. Okay. The people who really were vehemently anti-big business. They wanted to break up big business through antitrust. They wanted to pass all sorts of uh, radical redistribution uh, of wealth. So back then, you know, the radical income tax, right? Uh, very stringent sort of labor laws, et cetera. And the corporatists liked those when they could shape those laws to their advantage so they'd fall more on their competitors, et cetera. But they had this real, you know, the socialists would have this real big sort of uh, drive to change uh, the world, right? And to sort of remake the economy, vehemently anti-capitalist, very anti-money, et cetera. So if someone like a Theodore Roosevelt is a classic corporatist, Right, or a Morgan partner, George W. Perkins, is a corporatist, a William Jennings Bryan, a Louis D. Brandeis, maybe there's some names you're familiar with. Those are the classic socialists or populists. Okay. In sort of the combiner of both groups would sort of be like a Woodrow Wilson, right? who's sort of able to lean to one group, then lean to another, and he was able to kind of get them to work together to accomplish their goals so they could all enrich themselves at the expense of the average consumer, the average taxpayer, uh, the public, so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, you know, these, those were sort of some of the, uh, the progressives of the past. And what they wanted to do, uh, they passed all sorts of various laws, regulatory commissions I just mentioned, the income tax, right? They only said the income, the income tax is only going to apply to the 1%. Okay. We know how that turned out all sorts of various environmental laws, labor laws, et cetera, in the early 1900s, right? And these were a threat. They were, they slowed down economic growth. They hurt personal liberty, especially in World War I, which is when the progressives were really running the government, so on and so forth, okay? So it, it truly is a threat, a sort of the threat of the past, okay? A classic progressivist intellectual was someone known as Richard T. Eli, okay? Fiery, you know, very, very religious, very sort of fiery. Uh, he said, you know, God works through the state. The state is religious in its essence. So you had to stamp out sin. You had to correct the world, all right, supporting all these various interventions and so on. So those were the people sort of running the government back then. Okay. Now, who are the modern progressives? Who are the people we have to look forward to now? All the people I named, they're, they're, they're long gone. You know, they're, they've been dead for, 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 for many years, all right? So the progressive now, all right, they're not Yankee, but you could say at least they congregate in New England, right? You know, around all the Ivy Leagues right, in, in Boston. And where do they also congregate? Where do they spread out sort of in Yankee fashion, right? They spread out to the cities, the big elite cities, New York City, Washington, D.C., Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles. The rest of the country is... This is the flyover states, sort of like where you go if you're going to vacation somewhere, if you've got to travel across the country from L.A. to New York or something like that, okay? They're no longer religious, but they still have that in the sense that, 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 that drive to, to remake the world, to shape it according to how they see, because the religion is no longer some particular type of Christianity. You know, the religion is egalitarianism, or it's really the state. The state will take care of you. The government can solve your problems. Big brother can take care of you, right? You know, we can all, the government will, will solve our problems, but we will use the government to sort of usher in a new epoch or a new era, all right? They didn't go to Germany for their PhDs, but they're certainly credentialed. They've got elite degrees, elite PhDs and other sorts of uh, graduate degrees from the elite Ivy Leagues and the California state schools and so on. You also got University of Chicago, 
right, in Chicago there. Um, uh, they, they have, you know, they, they have this intense sort of elitism, or what may be called, the medical term is known as ivory tower syndrome, so that they know what's better for you than what you know, right? They've got the degree, you know, they got their PhD from, a, from an established place, so on and so forth. So they have that, they have that drive, right? They have that, they have that you know, that, 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 that intense sort of academic credential where they can sort of boss around the world. They don't believe in eugenics, but they're still heavily elitist in that they want to try and now shape the world and adjust the labor supply, sort of teach people, indoctrinate people to believe a certain way, right? Sort of the egalitarianism, the wokeism, the social justice, the, 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 the general uh, sea change in schools and thinkings, et cetera, that collectivist sort of idea where the collective is greater than the individual, they have that. And of course, everyone else is equal except for them, right? You know, you've read the stories of various high profile politicians in prominent areas. They're saying, oh, everyone's got to wear a face mask or you can't work out, the gyms are closed, but then like they're able to get a secret little gym or they're able to get like a little uh, table in an Italian restaurant in New York, right? So I'm not naming names, but people know who I'm talking about, right? Um, and uh, so they, they, they have, you know, they're better than you, right? And they want you to know that they're better than you, okay? And they're also very interventionist. It's no surprise now that many leading neoconservatives, foreign policy hawks are all progressives, okay? Supporting sort of this, all right, America has to take this leadership position in the world, and that leadership position always comes with spending more money, which of course justifies higher taxes and government borrowing in Federal Reserve monetization of the debt and so on and so forth, okay? In terms of their economic ideologies, you still have the conservatives and the, so excuse me, the, uh, the corporatists and the socialists, right? The corporatists of today, they're those connected with Wall Street and big tech. So Amazon, Alphabet, the company, that, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Uber, so on and so forth, right? Where they support safety regulations, internet regulations, et cetera, that's going to hurt their competitors more than they will, all right? That they have the comparative advantage in uh, working around. So the tech companies, clearly their employees can work from home or more easily from home. Amazon, you know, not saying they've been intentionally, you know, pushing the coronavirus, but they certainly benefit their business goes up from these lockdowns, et cetera. You know, you, ever, you buy everything from Amazon now. Um, you know, and they, these large companies, even the restaurants, et cetera, they can retool their facilities to have the face mask mandates or to have the, 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 the shields or you have the, all right, you got the little things on the ground where you got to stay six feet apart. If not, you know, you're going to spread the plague and so on. So they have these, uh, they have that advantage uh, that, that the, they, they can suffer the compliance costs, et cetera. So they don't want to break, have antitrust break up their companies, but they support sort of federal laws regulating their industries. You know, the big tech companies got big through the free market, but now they want to use government intervention to sort of cripple their competitors, okay? And of course, you have the socialists. So the people who are supporting these ridiculously grandiose ideas, like the, new, the Green New Deal, right, where it cost an astounding $93 trillion overall over the years. Now, of course, they always say it's going to cost less because that's what you do. You conceal the cost. It's like running for, it's like election 101, right? Um, they have the universal basic income, right? Where now the government is your, is, your, is your right to stay at home and play video games all day uh, and have the government pay you so you can live, you know, life. You can rent a house with like four other people and do that. They support these wealth taxes. Now, of course, they only say it's going to happen to the 1%, but remember with the income tax, because there's got to be some way you're going to pay for the impending entitlement crisis and all of the other programs and so on and so forth. So you still have these very sort of radical ideas that the corporatists would also like as long as they can make sure they benefit so they get some of those environmental subsidies. They make sure that the universal basic income and the wealth tax is offloaded onto the middle class, the cost at least. That's what happened to Social Security. Middle class mainly pays for Social Security. It's actually a regressive tax, right? The rich don't really pay that much for it. Again, even though the common perception is the opposite, but that's how you sell that progressive cronyism, okay? So, you know, if you think of today, at least, think of someone like a, a Hillary Clinton would be a classic corporatist, a Bernie Sanders 
or an Elizabeth Warren or an AOC would be a classic sort of socialist, right? Those groups, you know, who would sort of be the, the Woodrow Wilson kind of combining really both of those groups, sort of doing the straddle back and forth, you know, what would be going on? And I think it's the best, uh, you know, would probably be Kamala Harris, at least, where you think of someone who's straddling both of those and is really kind of sort of the Democrat nominee um, for, for president, you know, something like a William Crawford or a William Henry Harrison thing is going on with Biden. Um, but, you know, that's kind of who you're really sort of voting for. Um, and, you know, you think about it, and this isn't just to, like, play partisan, you know, uh, you know or something like that, but it really kind of covers all the, 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 the range because it's very corporatist background. Wall Street and big tech have donated very heavily to her campaigns, especially in California. She's had a lot of her former employees end up working for these large companies. She had a former senior counsel, left a couple years, years ago, now works for Amazon, right? A campaign manager, now works for Google. She's got a brother-in-law, works for Uber, stuff like that. And she's, you know, support those types of regulations that would really kind of entrench the monopoly right? The, these monopolies, you, know, you might have to talk the talk, you know, and act all populist and socialist, et cetera. But, you know, that's really kind of, you know, th those companies are making sure they're getting their money's worth, basically. And of course, also supports sort of the, the socialism of the radicals, you know, so the very enthusiastic proponent of the Green New Deal, it's now a Climate Equity Act too, so sort of combining environmentalism with social justice, things like that. All right, supported a $2,000 a month universal basic income during the coronavirus crisis. And of course, that crisis would end whenever the government would want it to end. All right, so it's kind of like 2000. And we've already sort of seen the opening wedge to the universal basic income with the Trump bucks and all of that. All right. And of course, the wealth tax, those very radical proposals uh, to, 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 uh, to, to pay for all of these uh, government programs and so on. You know, really in many ways kind of embodies that sort of Woodrow Wilson uh, sort of progressive, progressivist, right? Sort of the, the, the threat kind of, of, of progressivism, right? And of course you see, obviously with the continuation, the progressives, you know, all of this Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, you know, everyone continuing all the lockdowns, you know, Joe Biden, something with like a national, uh, you know, face mask mandate, you know, something like that and so on. You know, really radical proposals that a lot of these proposals, you know, it's sort of like, you know, again, you, gotta, you choose between the lesser of two evils, and it's not looking good either way, but it, it's really kind of like a, a, a sort of, it's a threat. It's a threat to our economic well-being. These programs, they're going to impoverish us, they're going to wipe out savings. They're going to hurt our future generations, as Jeff, Jeff said, our children and, and their children and so on, right? It's a threat to our personal liberty, right? You know, this, a lot of the, what's been going on recently, you know, I don't know if you've had people affected, but in terms of just depression and suicides and alcoholism and drug abuse, you know, all of that will go, you know, has gone up and that maybe would even continue to go up uh, in, the, in, in the years ahead. So it really is sort of a threat. You know, it's a giant sort of crony juggernaut where the government is, is sort of trying to enrich themselves at the expense of you, all right? So to sort of wrap up here, I guess, uh, to try and combine everything with what, I've, what I've been saying, uh, the great sort of, uh, you think of the libertarian critic H.L. Mencken once had a very uh, funny comment about the progressives, or really the Puritans, but it equally applies to the progressives. He said, the great Puritan fear is when someone, is somewhere, somewhere someone is having fun. That's the great, that's the great Puritan fear, right? Because if you're having fun, then you can't, you, you can't save the world. So in that vein, the great progressive fear, right, the great modern progressive fear is that somewhere someone is not wearing a face mask. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>